trust. A trust is an arrangement in which property is transferred from one person called the settlor to an individual called the trustee who's going to hold that property for the benefit of yet another person or persons called the beneficiary. So let's break this down. The settlor is the one who creates the trust. The settlor goes by several different names. Uh, may be called grantor, may be called creator, may be called even trustor. But that is the person that owns the property and will be creating the trust. Now, you may remember that uh, or may have heard of property being talked about as a bundle of rights. You know, that's one model to look at at what property is. Property is just an abstract concept. And one way to explain that abstract concept is that property is a bundle of rights. Okay, if we look at property that way, and, and try to use that to explain trust, this is what we come up with. The settlor, as the owner of property, has a right to possess that property and control that property and enjoy that property and even dispose of that property. But when the settlor creates a trust, the settlor is essentially breaking up or dividing that bundle of rights between a trustee who will have legal title of the property as trustee and the beneficiaries who will have equitable title. And so that those bundle of rights end up with the trustee having possession and control of the property and being able to dispose of the property. But the person that has the right to enjoy the property, and that's the whole point of the trust, is going to be the beneficiary. So why do we use trusts? We use trusts to reduce taxes. A lot of it's all about money uh, and, co and convenience and ease. And so reducing taxes is going to be at the top of the list for why we use some of these trusts. Uh, to avoid the probate process uh, when, when someone has, has passed and we're having to uh, prove their will, uh, if we use trust creatively and properly, we may not even have to probate a will that they have left. Just depend, that's part of the estate planning process. We use it to avoid guardianship where uh, someone is going to leave property to their minor children, perhaps. And in the event those children are minors, when they take the, the property, minors can't uh, invest the property, uh, make contracts, make legal decisions regarding that property. So we want that property in the hands of someone who can. Well, that's going to be traditionally a guardian, which in most cases involves a lot of court oversight, a lot of expense, uh, a lot of attorneys, attorney fees. So, so what we do is we put it all in a trust. And as we'll, we'll make mention a little bit later, testamentary trust to avoid guardianship of the estate for, for children. Uh, we use, use trust to manage property for people who do not have, our loved ones who don't have capacity, like children or, or older folks, or even planning for our own possible incapacity. We'll set up a trust. Uh, it allows, trusts allow for more flexible estate planning, gives us another tool that we can work with. And of course, as I mentioned before, using trust can certainly hold down costs and expenses. Okay, a few terms about trust. First one, corpus. What is the corpus? The corpus is the body of the, the trust. It's the trust property that is held by the trustee. Next is the trust instrument. Now, not all trusts are reduced to writing. You know, there are some situations where you could have an oral trust, and there are going to be other instances where we say that uh, the trust may be implied, but, but certainly where we get to trusts that are expressly made, those, docu those uh, trusts frequently are expressed in writing, and we call that writing the trust document. It sets forth the terms of the trust, it identifies the trustee, identifies the beneficiary, it identifies uh, the rights and duties, 
uh, of both the trustee and the beneficiary. It sets out the purpose of the trust. Why we have this trust? Is it to uh, uh, provide support and care, maintenance uh, for the individual? Is it, it, or is the trust perhaps for some charitable purpose? So, what is the purpose of the trust? You'll find that in the trust instrument. And then, of course, what is the duration of the trust? And uh, as a general rule, as we're going to see in, in, on a later board here. Uh, private trusts are going to be limited in their duration, whereas charitable tr trusts uh, generally are not going to be limited in their duration. We'll get to that in just a moment. Let's talk about the trustee. The trustee is going to have certain powers. They're, they're the type of powers that a person would have if they're the legal owner of property. Uh, owner of property can sell that property, can sell the assets. They can lease that property. They can carry on business with that property. They can lend and borrow money. Uh, they, you can, uh, owner of property can manage that property, insure that property. Well, those are the types of powers that the trustee will have. But the trustee also has some duties, duties to the beneficiaries because actually, after all, as we already said, the beneficiaries have the equitable title. They have the, uh, the, the right to use and enjoy and benefit from the property. Uh, so what are the duties the, the, that the trustee has to the beneficiary? The first of all is the duty of loyalty, uh, duty of due care to, to act uh, towards the property, manage the property as if it were their own, to, to manage it with that type of care. And as I said, loyalty to the beneficiary. They have a duty to preserve the corpus, not let it waste away, not let the property waste away and go uninvested or, or uh, be poorly managed. Uh, they have a right to, uh, or rather all these are duties, have the duty to invest the uh, corpus. I, got called in on a case one time, and uh, it was a granddaughter who uh, was uh, managing uh, the estate for her grandmother, and she had $99,000 $99, in a non-interest bearing checking account. I mean, that was the estate. And the curious thing was, she was the one that was going to get it all after her grandmother passed. And so she, she certainly wasn't investing the corpus uh, properly at that point. Uh, you have to make distributions as trustee according to the trust instrument uh, to pay the bills, to, to pay lump sum out to the beneficiaries if that's, if that's what it is. So whatever the, the, the uh, uh, instrument says, for making distributions, you have a duty to do that as trustee. And then, of course, finally, to account for all the money. Where is all the money? How much came into trustees' hands? And what did they act uh, appropriately with that money? We have classifications of trusts as well. Trust can either be expressed or implied. An express trust is, is one that is expressly set out, uh, usually in writing, but it, in some instances could be oral, and it's, they're created for an explicit purpose. Implied trusts are going to be implied under the law uh, in different situations. Uh, these are, are generally not going to be the intentional uh, type of uh, express, these will not be express uh, trusts that we use in estate planning. Uh, we have two types of, it, of implied trust, a resulting trust, that's when someone buys uh, an asset or like a car and uh, with their money, uh, but they put it maybe in someone else's name uh, or something like that. And you can say, well, there, there's uh, implied a trust in there somewhere. Um, constructive trust where, where courts will use a, this mechanism to to avoid someone from becoming uh, unjustly uh, enriched or, or uh, taking advantage of someone in a, in a, um, uh, weak, uh, a lesser position. Um, so, you know, particularly where someone may be trying to hide money or funds and the court may impose a constructive trust in that situation. 
uh, trusts can be private or public. Uh, the private trusts are generally whether going to be uh, or, or going to be uh, benefiting particular people, uh, a family, uh, particular family members, that sort of thing. Typically, whereas a charitable trust is going to be, a public trust is going to be used for some social benefit, a, a charitable trust of some kind. Intervivalist trust is going to be, and sometimes known as a living trust, uh, is going to be created during the lifetime of the settlor. And it's going to be funded during the lifetime of the settlor. And it's going to be up and running during the lifetime of the settlor. That's why we call it a living trust or a during lifetime trust, interim fivos trust. Versus a testamentary trust that we put into the will and it has no effect until the testator passes. And then we have this point that I had mentioned earlier about there being a time limit on, on trust. We have the rule against perpetuities. It's, a, it's an old rule. It, it confuses and confounds uh, law students and lawyers alike. And uh, it's even been modified uh, by, by some states. But uh, let me just give you a little look at it here. Certainly not trying to turn you into an expert on rule against perpetuities, but you have to understand what the purpose is. The purpose of the rule against perpetuities, what does perpetuity mean? I mean, it goes on and on and on and on, and you can't do that generally with a trust. The purpose is to limit the ability of an owner to control the future disposition of, of the trust property. And this generally applies to private trusts, charitable trusts, are allowed to go on and on and on in, uh, perpetually, but not private trusts. Public or charitable trusts can. Here's the rule. An interest must vest not later than 21 years after some life and being at the time of creation of the interest plus a period of gestation. So that what they're trying to do is set out a period of time where it is acceptable to, to take uh, the property and, and split that bundle of rights so that you've got one person with trust called trustee with one bundle of rights and a smaller bundle of rights uh, that used to enjoy uh, the uh, right to enjoy that property is with the beneficiary. But at some point, the two have to come back together again. And that's what we call vesting, when all of this bundle of rights become one bundle of rights again and it all has to, to vest back in, in one ownership. Now, Example would be uh, this S or settlor leaves, uh, puts the money in trust for the settlor's children and then for the lives of the settlor's grandchildren. In, in some states, many states, this may be void because depending on the circumstances, these grandchildren in the future may be the children of the settlor who haven't even been born yet when the settlor creates the trust. Depends on the circumstances. Uh, this one, so that one might be void in, in some states. Other states, it may be okay. Uh, another example, but it definitely, you know, there, there may not be a limit on, on definite limit here. But on the second one, settlor in trust for settlor's children until they reach the age of 21. Okay, then we, we, we have a, a specific limit on it, and that is a good example of a trust that does not violate the rule against perpetuities. And that is an overview of trusts.